Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Short Stories, where today we are continuing our reading of Robert Louis Stevenson's book, Treasure Island. We're now on chapter nine, well into part two of the story, and young Jim Hawkins is just about to set sail with the crew of the Hispaniola to try and uncover the treasure in the map of old Billy Bones, the captain who, for a time, resided at the Admiral Benbow Inn, run by Jim's parents. Now, we shall open up our tale and see where the story takes us next. arrived at chapter nine, Powder and Arms. The Hispaniola lay some way out, and we went under the figureheads and round the sterns of many other ships, and their cables sometimes grated underneath our keel, and sometimes swung above us. This must be in the little rowboat that Jim and the Squire and Dr. Livesey are taking to the Hispaniola, which has obviously been moored some way out in the harbour, rather than being directly on the pier. So that is why they are navigating around all of these other vessels in Bristol Harbour. At last, however, we got alongside, and were met and saluted as we stepped aboard, by the mate, Mr. Arrow, a brown old sailor, with earrings in his ears and a squint. He and the squire were very thick and friendly, but I soon observed that things were not the same between Mr. Trelawney and the captain. This last was a sharp-looking man, who seemed angry with everything on board, and was soon to tell us why, for we had hardly got down into the cabin when a sailor followed us. Captain Smollett, sir, asks him to speak with you, said he. I am always at the captain's orders. Show him in, said the squire. The captain, who was close behind his messenger, entered at once and shut the door behind him. Well, Captain Smollett, what have you to say? All well, I hope? All ship-shape and seaworthy? Well, sir, 
said the captain. Better speak plain, I believe, even at the risk of offence. I don't like this cruise. I don't like the men. And I don't like my officer. That's short and sweet. Perhaps, sir, you don't like the ship? inquired the squire, very angry, as I could see. I can't speak as to that, sir, not having seen her tried, said the captain. She seems a clever craft, more, I can't say. Possibly, sir, you may not like your employer either, says the squire, but here Dr. Livesey cut in. Stay a bit, said he, stay a bit. No use of such questions as that, but to produce ill feeling. The captain has said too much, or he has said too little, and I am bound to say that I require an explanation of his words. You don't, you say, like this cruise now. Why? I was engaged, sir, on what we call sealed orders, to sail this ship for that gentleman where he should bid me, said the captain. So far, so good. But now I find that every man before the mast knows more than I do. I don't call that fair now, do you? No, said Dr. Livesey, I don't. Next, said the captain, I learn we are going after treasure. Hear it from my own hands, mind you. Now treasure is ticklish work. I don't like treasure voyages on any account, and I don't like them, above all, when they are secret, and when, begging your pardon, Mr. Trelawney, the secret has been told to the parrot. Silver's parrot? asked the squire. It's, it's a way of speaking, said the captain. Blabbed, I mean. It's my belief neither of you gentlemen know what you're about. But I'll tell you my way of it. Life or death, and a close run. That is all clear, and, I dare say, true enough, replied Dr. Livesey. We take the risk, but we are not so ignorant as you believe us. Next, you say you don't like the crew. Are they not good seamen? I don't like them, sir, returned Captain Smollett. And I think I should have had the choosing of my own hands, if you go to that. Well, perhaps you should, replied the doctor. My friend should, perhaps, have taken you along with him. But the slight, if there be one, was unintentional. And you don't like Mr. Arrow? I don't, sir. I believe he's a good seaman. But he's too free with the crew to be a good officer. A mate should keep himself to himself, shouldn't drink with the men before the mast. Do you mean he drinks? cried the squire. No, sir, replied the captain, only that he's too familiar. 
Well now, and the short and the long of it, Captain? Asked the doctor. Tell us, what do you want? Well, gentlemen, you are... Determined to go on this cruise? Like I am, answered the squire. Very good, said the captain. Then, as you've heard me very patiently, saying things that I could not prove, hear me a few words more. They are putting the powder and the arms in the forehold. Now, you have a good place under the cabin. Why not put them there? First point. Then, you are bringing four of your own people with me. And they tell me some of them are to be berthed forward. Why not give them the berths here, beside the cabin? Second point. Any more? asked Mr. Trelawney. One more, said the captain. There's been too much blabbing already. Far too much, agreed the doctor. I'll tell you what I've heard myself, continued Captain Smollett. That you have a map of an island. That there's crosses on the map to show where the treasure is. And that the island lies... And then he named the exact latitude and longitude exactly. I never told that, cried the squire, to a soul. The hands know it, sir, returned the captain. Livesey, that must have been you or Hawkins, cried the squire. It doesn't much matter who it was replied the doctor, and I could see that neither he nor the captain paid much regard to Mr. Trelawney's protestations. Neither did I, to be sure. He was so loose a talker, yet, in this case, I believe he was really right, and that nobody had told the situation of the island. Well, gentlemen, continued the captain, I don't know who has this map, but I make it a point. It should be kept secret, even from me and Mr. Arrow. Otherwise, I would ask you to let me resign. I see, said the doctor. You wish us to keep part this matter dark, and to make a garrison of the stern part of the ship, manned with my friend's own people, and provided with all the arms and powder on board. In other words, you fear a mutiny. Sir, said Captain Smollett, with no intention to take offence, I deny your right to put words into my mouth. No captain, sir, would be justified in going to sea at all if he had any ground to say that. As for Mr. Arrow, I believe him thoroughly honest. Some of the men are the same. All may be, from what I know. But I am responsible for the ship's safety and the life of every man Jack aboard of her. I see things going, as I think, not quite right, and I ask you to take certain precautions, or let me resign my berth. And that's all. Captain Smollett, began the doctor with a smile, did you ever hear the fable of the mountain and the mouse? You'll excuse me, I dare say, but you remind me of that fable. 
When you came in here, I'll stake my wig. You meant more than this. Doctor, said the captain, you are smart. When I came in here, I meant to get discharged. I had no thought that Mr. Trelawney would hear a word. No more I would, cried the squire. Had Livesey not been here, I should have seen you to the deuce. As it is, I have heard you. I will do as you desire, but I think the worse of you. That's as you please, sir, said the doctor. Excuse me, said the captain. You'll find I do my duty here. And with that, he took his leave. Trelawney, said the doctor, contrary to all my notions, I believe you have managed to get two honest men on board with you. That man and John Silver. Silver, if you like, cried the squire. But as for that intolerable humbug, I declare I think his conduct unmanly, unsailorly, and downright un-English. Well, says the doctor, we shall see. When we came on deck, the men had begun already to take out the arms and powder, yo-hoing at their work, while the captain and Mr. Arrow stood by, superintending. The new arrangement was quite to my liking. The whole schooner had been overhauled. Six berths had been made astern out of what had been the afterpart of the main hold, and this set of cabins was only joined to the galley and forecastle by a sparred passage on the port side. It had been originally meant that the captain, Mr. Arrow, Hunter, Joyce, the doctor, and the squire were to occupy these six berths. Now, Redruth and I were to get two of them, and Mr. Arrow and the captain were to sleep on deck in the companion, which had been enlarged on each side, till you might almost have called it a roundhouse. Very low it was still, of course, but there was room to swing two hammocks, and even the mate seemed pleased with the arrangement. Even he, perhaps, had been doubtful as to the crew. But that is only guess, for, as you shall hear, we had not long the benefit of his opinion. Mm, some interesting foreshadowing there. I suppose some of us know how the story goes, but for those of you yet to learn the fate of Mr. Arrow, we shall read on. We were all hard at work, changing the powder and the berths, when the last man or two, and Long John along with them, came off in a shore boat. The cook came up the side like a monkey for cleverness, and as soon as he saw what was doing, So ho, mates, says he, what's this? We're changing of the powder, Jack, answers one. Why, by the powers, cried Long John, if we do, we'll miss the morning tide. My orders, said the captain shortly. You may go below, my man. Hands will want supper. Aye, aye, sir, answered the cook, and, touching his forelock, he disappeared at once in the direction 
of his galley. That's a good man, Captain, said the doctor. Very likely, sir, replied Captain Smollett. Easy with that, men, easy, he ran on to the fellows who were shifting the powder, and then suddenly observing me, examining the swivel we carried amidships, a long brass nine. Here, you, ship's boy, he cried, out of that. Off with you to the cook and get some work. And then, as I was hurrying off, I heard him say, quite loudly, to the doctor, I'll have no favourites on my ship. I assure you, I was quite of the squire's way of thinking, and hated the captain deeply. Chapter 10 The Voyage All that night we were in a great bustle, getting things stowed in their place and boatfuls of the squire's friends, Mr. Blandley and the like, coming off to wish him a good voyage and safe return. We never had a night of the Admiral Benbow when I had half the work, and I was dog-tired when, a little before dawn, the boatswain sounded his pipe and the crew began to man the capstan bars. I might have been twice as weary, yet I would not have left the deck. All was so new and interesting to me. The brief commands, the shrill note of the whistle, the men bustling to their places. In the glimmer of the ship's lanterns, Now, Barbecue, dip us a stave, cried one voice. The old one, cried another. Aye, aye, mates, said Long John, who was standing by with his crutch under his arm, and at once broke out in the air and words I knew so well. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, and then... The whole crew bore chorus, Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. And at the third ho, drove the bars before them with a will. Even at that exciting moment, it carried me back to the old Admiral Benbow in a second and I seemed to hear the voice of the captain piping up in the chorus. But soon the anchor was short up, soon it was hanging dripping at the bows, soon the sails began to draw, and the land and shipping to flit by on either side. And before I could lie down to catch an hour of slumber. The Hispaniola had begun her voyage to the Isle of Treasure. I am not going to relate that voyage in detail. It was fairly prosperous. The ship proved to be a good ship, and the crew were capable seamen and the captain thoroughly understood his business. But before we came the length of Treasure Island, two or three things had happened which require to be known. Mr. Arrow, first of all, turned out even worse than the captain had feared. He had no command among the men, 
and people did what they pleased with him. But that was by no means the worst of it, for after a day or two at sea, he began to appear on deck with hazy eye, red cheeks, stuttering tongue, and other marks of drunkenness. Time after time he was ordered below in disgrace. Sometimes he fell and cut himself. Sometimes he lay all day long in his little bunk at one side of the companion. Sometimes for a day or two he would almost sober, sober and attend to his work, at least passably. In the meantime, we could never make out where he got the drink. That was the ship's mystery. Watch him as we pleased. We could do nothing to solve it. And when we asked him to his face, he would only laugh if he were drunk. And if he were sober, deny solemnly that he ever tasted anything but water. He was not only useless as an officer, and a bad influence among the men, but it was plain that at this rate he must soon kill himself outright. So nobody was much surprised, nor very sorry, when one dark night, with a head sea, he disappeared entirely and was seen no more. Overboard, said the captain. Well, gentlemen, that saves us the trouble of putting him in irons. But there we were, without a mate. And it was necessary, of course, to advance one of the men. The boatswain, Job Anderson, was the likeliest man aboard, and, though he kept his old title, he served, in a way, as mate. Mr. Trelawney had followed the sea, and his knowledge made him very useful he often took a watch himself in easy weather. And the coxswain, Israel Hands, was a careful, wily, old, experienced seaman, who could be trusted at a pinch with almost anything. He was a great confidant of Long John Silver, and so the mention of his name leads me on to speak of our ship's cook, Barbecue, as the men called him. Aboard ship, he carried his crutch by a lanyard around his neck, so as to have both hands free as possible. It was something to see him wedge the foot of the crutch against a bulkhead, and, propped against it, yielding to every movement of the ship, get on with his cooking like someone safe ashore. Still more strange was it to see him, in the heaviest of weather, cross the deck. He had a line or two rigged up to help him across the widest spaces. Long John's earrings, they were called, and he would hand himself from one place to another, now using the crutch, now trailing it alongside by the lanyard as quickly as another man could walk. Yet some of the men who had sailed with him before 
expressed their pity to see him so reduced. He's no common man, Barbecue, said the coxswain to me. He had a good schooling in his young days, and can speak like a book when so minded. Oh, I'm brave. A lion's nothing alongside a long john. I seen him grapple for and knock their heads together, him unarmed. All the crew respected, and even obeyed him. He had a way of talking to each, and doing everybody some particular service. To me, he was unwearily kind, and always glad to see me in the galley, which he kept as clean as a new pin, the dishes hanging up burnished, and his parrot in a cage in one corner. Come away, organs, he would say. Come and have a yarn with John. Nobody more welcome than yourself, my son. Sit you down and hear the news. Here's Captain Flint. I calls my parrot Captain Flint after the famous buccaneer. Here's Captain Flint predicting success to our voyage. Wasn't that you, Captain? And the parrot would say with great rapidity, pieces of eight, pieces of eight, pieces of eight, till you wondered that it was not out of breath, or till John threw his handkerchief over the cage. No, that bird, he would say, is maybe two or three hundred years old Hawkins. They lives forever, mostly. And if anybody's seen more wickedness, it must be the devil himself. She sailed with England, the great Captain England, the pirate. She's been at Madagascar, and Malabar, and Suriname, and Providence, and Porto Bello. She was at the fishing up of the wrecked plate ships. It's there she learned pieces of eight, and little wonder. Three hundred and fifty thousand of them, Hawkins. She was at the boarding of the Viceroy of the Indies, out of Goa she was. And to look at her, you would think she was a babby. But you smelled powder, didn't you, Captain? Stand by to go about, the parrot would scream. Ah, she's a handsome craft, she is, the cook would say, and give her sugar from his pocket. And then the bird would peck at the bars and swear straight on, passing belief for wickedness. <laughs> There, John would add, you can't touch pitch and not be mocked, lad. Here's this poor old innocent bird of mine swearing blue fire, and none the wiser. You may lay to that. She wouldn't swear the same, in a manner of speaking, before chaplain. And John would touch his forelock with a solemn way he had that made me think, he was the best of men. In the meantime, Squire and Captain Smollett were still on pretty distant terms with one another. The Squire made no bones about the matter. He despised the Captain. The Captain, on his part, never spoke but when he was spoken to, and then sharp and short. Sure and dry, and not a word wasted. He owned, when driven into a corner, that he seemed to have been wrong about the crew, that some of them were as brisk as he wanted to see, and that all had behaved fairly well. 
As for the ship, he had taken a downright fancy to her. She'll lie a point nearer the wind than a man has right to expect of his own married wife, sir. But, he would add, all I say is, we're not home again, and I don't like the cruise. The squire, at this, would turn away and march up and down the deck, chin in the air. A trifle more of that man, he would say, and I should explode. We had some heavy weather, which only proved the qualities of the Hispaniola. Every man on board seemed well content, and they must have been hard to please if they had been otherwise, for it is my belief there was never a ship's com company so spoiled since Noah put to sea. Double grog was going on the least excuse. There was duff on odd days, as, for instance, if the squire heard it was any man's birthday, and always a barrel of apples standing broached in the waist, for anyone to help himself that had a fancy. Never knew good come of it yet, the captain said to Dr. Livesey. Spoil forecastle hands, make devils. That's my belief. But good did come of the apple barrel, as you shall hear. For if it had not been for that, we should have had no note of warning and might all have perished by the hand of treachery. This was how it came about. We had run up the trades to get the wind of the island we were after. I am not allowed to be more plain, and now we were running down for it with a bright lookout, day and night. It was about the last day of our outward voyage, by the largest computation. Sometime that night, or, at latest, before noon of the morrow, we should sight the treasure island. We were heading south-southwest, and had a steady breeze abeam and a quiet sea. The Hispaniola rolled steadily dipping her bowsprit now and then with a whiff of spray. All was drawing alow and aloft. Everyone was in the bravest spirits, because we were now so near an end of the first part of our adventure. Now, just after sundown, when all my work was over and I was on my way to my berth, it occurred to me that I should like an apple. I ran on deck. The watch was all four looking out for the island. The man at the helm was watching the luff of the sail, and whistling away gently to himself. And that was the only sound, excepting the swish of the sea against the bows and around the sides of the ship. In I got bodily into the apple barrel and found there was scarce an apple left. But sitting down there in the dark, what with the sound of the waters and the rocking movement of the ship, I had either fallen asleep or was on the point of doing so, when a heavy man sat down with a rather a clash close by. The barrel shook as he leaned his shoulders against it, and I was just about to jump up when the man began to speak. It was Silver's voice, 
and, before I had heard a dozen words, I would not have shown myself for all the world, but lay there, trembling and listening, in the extreme of fear and curiosity. For from these dozen words I understood that the lives of all the honest men aboard depended on me alone. Oh, that would be quite a cliffhanger to leave off at. But I think today we've got time for one more chapter. Oh, I don't think I could have resisted even if we hadn't. So let us turn the page and find out what it is that Jim overhears. Ah. <laughs> An appropriate title. Chapter 11. What I Heard in the apple barrel. No, not I, said Silver. Flint was captain. I was quartermaster, along with my timber and leg. On the same broadside, I lost my leg. Old Pew lost his deadlights. There was a master surgeon him that amputated me. At Luke College and all, Latin by the bucket and what not. But he was hanged like a dog, and sun dried like the rest at Corso Castle. That was Robert's men, that was, and come to changing names to their ships, royal fortune and so on. No, what a ship was christened. So let her stay, I says. So it was with the Cassandra, as brought us all safe home from the Malabar. After England took the Viceroy of the Indies, so it was with the old walrus, Flint's old ship, as I've seen a muck with the red blood, and fit to sink with gold. cried another voice, that of the youngest hand on board, and evidently full of admiration. He was the flower of the dog, was Flint. Davis was a man, too, by all accounts, said Silver. I never sailed along of him, first with England, then with Flint. That's my story. And now, here, on my own account, in a manner of speaking. I laid by nine hundred safe from England and two thousand after Flint. That ain't bad for a man before the mast, all safe in bank. Taint earning now, it's saving, does it? You may lay to that. Where's all England's men now? I don't know. Where's Flint's? Why, most of them aboard here, and glad to get the duff. Been begged before that, some of them. Old Pew has lost his sight, and might have thought shame. Spends twelve hundred pound in a year, like a lord in Parliament. Where is he now? Well, he's dead now, and under hatches. But for two years before that, shiver my timbers, the man was starving. He begged, and he stole, and he cut throats, and starved at that by the powers. Well, it ain't much use after all, said the young seaman. It ain't much use for food. You may lay to it, that or nothing, cried Silver. But now, you look here. You're young, you are, but you're as smart as paint. 
I see that when I set my eyes on you, and I'll talk to you like a man. You may imagine how I felt when I heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words of flattery as he had used to myself. I think if I had been able that I would have killed him through the barrel. Meanwhile, he ran on, little supposing he was overheard. Here it is about gentlemen of fortune. They live lives rough, and they risk swinging. But they eat and drink like fighting cocks. And when a cruise is done, why? It's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets. No. The most goes for rum and a good fling, and to see again in their shirts. But that's not the course. I lay. I puts it all away. Some here, some there, and none too much anywheres, by reason of suspicion. I'm fifty, mark you. Once back from this cruise, I set up gentlemen in earnest. Time enough, too, says you, but I've lived easy in the meantime. Never denied myself for nothing heart desires, and slept soft, and ain't dainty all my days but when at sea. And how did I begin? Before the mast, like you. Well, said the other, but all the other money's gone now, ain't it? You daren't show face in Bristol after this. Why, where might you suppose it was? asked Silver derisively. At Bristol, in banks and places, answered his companion. It were, said the cook. It were when we weighed anchor, but my old missus has it all by now, and the spyglass is sold, lease and goodwill and riggin, and the old girl's off to meet me. I would tell you where, for I trust you, but it'd make jealousy among the mates. And you can trust your missus, asked the other. Gentlemen of fortune, returned the cook usually trust little among themselves. Right they are, you may lay to it. But I have a way with me, I have. When a mate brings a slip on his cable, one as knows me, I mean, it won't be in the same world with old John. There was some that was feared of Pew, and some that was feared of Flint. But Flint his own self, was feared of me. Feared he was, and proud. They was the roughest crew afloat, was Flint's. The devil himself would have been feared to go to sea with him. Well, no, I tell you, I'm not a boasting man, and you've seen yourself how easy I keep company. But when I was quartermaster, Lambs wasn't the word for Flint's old buccaneers. And you may, be, you may be sure of yourself in old John's ship. Well, I tell you now, replied the lad, I didn't half a quarter like the job till I had this talk with you, John. But there's my hand on it now. And a brave lad you were, and smart, too, answered Silver, shaking hands so heartily that all the barrel shook. And a finer figurehead for a gentleman of fortune I never clap my eyes on. By this time I had begun to understand the meaning of their terms. By a gentleman of fortune... They plainly meant neither more nor less 
when a common pirate and the little scene that I had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands, perhaps of the last one left aboard. But on this point I was soon to be relieved, for Silver giving a little whistle, a third man strolled up and sat down by the party. Dick Square, said Silver. Oh, I know Dick was square, returned the voice of the coxswain, his real hands. He's no fool, is Dick. And he turned his quid and spat. But look here, he went on. Here's what I want to know, Barbecue. How long are we going to stand off and on like a blessed bumboat? I've had almost enough of Captain Smollett. He's aged me long enough by thunder. I want to go into that cabin, I do. I want their pickles and wines and that. Israel, said Silver, your head ain't much account nor ever was, but you're able to hear, I reckon. Leastways, your ears is big enough. Now, here's what I say. You'll both fall. And you'll live hard, and you'll speak soft, and you'll keep sober, till I give the word. And you may lay to that, my son. Well, I don't say no, do I? growled the coxswain. What I say is, when? That's what I say. When, by the powers, cried Silver. Well, now, if you want to know, I'll tell you when last moment I can manage, and that's when. He's a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett, sails the blessed ship for us. Here's this squire and doctor with a map and such. I don't know where it is, do I? No more than you, says you. Well then, I mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff, and help us get it on board. By the powers, then we'll see. If I was sure of you all, sons of double Dutchmen, I'd have Captain Smollett navigate us halfway back before I struck. Why, well, we're all seamen aboard here, I should think. We're all forecastle hands, you mean, snapped Silver. We can steer to a course. But who's to set one? That's what all you gentlemen split on, first and last. If I had my way, I'd have Captain Smollett work us back into the trades, at least. Then we'd have no blessed miscalculations and a spoonful of water a day. But I know the sort you are. I'll finish with them at the island as soon as the blunt's on board, and a pity it is. But you're never happy till you're drunk. Split my sides are a sick heart to sail with the likes of you. Easy all long, John, cried Israel. Who's a crossin' of you? Why, how many tall ships, think ye now, have I seen laid aboard? How many brisk lads dryin' in the sun at execution dock, cried Silver. And all for this same hurry and hurry and hurry, you hear me? I seen a thing or two at sea, I have. If you would only lay your own course and point to windward, you would ride in carriages, you would. But not you, I know you. You'll have your mouthful of rum tomorrow and go hang. Everybody knowed you was kind of a chapling, John. But there's others as could hand and steer as well as you. They liked a bit of fun, they did. They wasn't so high and dry, no how. But took their fling, like jolly companions, every one. So, says Silver. Well, and where are they now? Pew was that sort, and he died a beggar man. Flynn was, and he died of rum in Savannah. Ah, they was a sweet crew, they was. Ollie, where are they? 
But, asked Dick, when do we lay them athwart? What we, what are we to do with them anyhow? There's the man for me, cried the cook admiringly. That's what I call business. Well, what would you think? Put them ashore like maroons? That would have been England's way. Or cut them down like that much pork? That would have been Flint or Billy Bones's. Billy was the man for that, said Israel. Dead men don't bite, says he. Well, he's dead now himself. He knows the long and short on it now. And if ever a rough hand came to port, it was Billy. Right you are, said Silva, rough and ready. But mark you here, I'm an easy man. I'm quite the gentleman, says you, but this time it's serious. Duty is duty, mates. I give my vote. Death. When I'm in Parliament and riding in my coach, I don't want none of these sea lawyers in the cabin a coming home unlooked for like the devil at prayers. Wait is what I say. But when the time comes, why, let her rip. John, cries the coxswain, you're a man. You'll say so, Israel, when you see, said Silva. Only one thing I claim. I claim Trelawney. I'll wring his calf's head off his body with these hands, Dick, he added, breaking off. You must jump up, like a sweet lad, and get me an apple to wet my pipe like. You may fancy the terror I was in. I should have leaped out and run for it if I had the strength, but but my limbs and heart alike misgave me. I heard Dick beginning to rise, and then someone seemingly stopped him, and the voice of Hans exclaimed, Oh, stow that. Don't you get suckin' of that bilge, John. Let's have a go of the rum. Dick, said Silver, I trust you. I have a gauge on the keg, mind. Here's the key. You fill a pannikin and bring it up. Terrified as I was, I could not help thinking to myself that this must have been how Mr. Arrow got the strong waters that destroyed him. Dick was gone but a little while, and during his absence Israel spoke straight on in the cook's ear. It was but a word or two that I could catch, and yet I gathered some important news for, besides other scraps that tended to the same purpose, this whole clause was audible. Not another man of them will join. Hence, there were still faithful men on board. When Dick returned, one after another of the trio took the pannikin and drank, one to luck, and another with a here's to old flint, and Silver himself saying, in a kind of song. Here's to ourselves, and here's to your luff, plenty of prizes and plenty of duff. Just then, a sort of brightness fell upon me in the barrel, and, looking up, I found that the moon had risen, and was silvering the mizzen top, and shining white on the luff of the foresail, and, Almost at the same time, the voice of the lookout shouted, Land ho! And, my friends, with an even greater cliffhanger than before, this is where we shall leave the story for today. But don't worry, I'll see you soon. We will in 
enjoy together the arrival of the Hispaniola at Treasure Island.